Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. If I didn't see it with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it. JP Morgan just came out and said that Bitcoin could potentially reach 45K. And when I took a look at this, I had to do a double take because I didn't think it was real. But here we are. So this is actually a piece done by The Block. And before we we delve into, into this and the pitfalls and the uh, terrible things that uh, could potentially happen along the way. As a quick reminder, JP Morgan uh, were the people that first said that Bitcoin had nothing to do with anything and it was just a, a big farce. Now, to be fair, we have to uh, differentiate between the CEO of JP Morgan, JP Diamond, and the actual monster conglomerate that is JP Morgan. However, if the CEO doesn't believe in some things, I think behind the scenes he may he may actually do that. But in 2015, he said, Jamie Dimon said, virtual currency will be stopped. Uh, 2017 says Bitcoin's a fraud. In 2019 or 2018 says he regrets calling Bitcoin a fraud and believes in the technology behind it. Same thing that China had said. They talked about how blockchain, not Bitcoin. Now they're doing a 180. And then, of course, we have here in 2020, he says Bitcoin is not my cup of tea. Even JP Morgan has warmed to crypto. 2021, he says investors could make Bitcoin 1% of portfolios. And this is in 2021. This is two years old. JP Morgan may offer actively managed Bitcoin fund. And it's just amazing how people just at some point come around. It may not be immediate, but they eventually usually do. So here's what the article talks about. And this is from a JP Morgan analyst or a strategist that says, with the gold price rising above $2,000, the value of gold held for investment purposes outside central banks is currently valued at around $3 trillion. This implies a $45,000 price for Bitcoin under the assumption that Bitcoin equalizes gold in private investors' portfolios and risk capital or volume adjusted terms. JP Morgan considers 45 grand as the upper limit which I don't think it is, indicating the limited potential for the asset beyond the increase driven by the doubling of mining or production costs. And of course, they're talking about the Bitcoin happening, having, which may happen on uh, April or May. It will mechanically double Bitcoin's production costs around 40 grand. This is because Bitcoin's production cost has historically acted as an effective lower bound. So there's a thing. If it's going to be $40,000 well, for production cost, I think that's debatable. But do you think people are just going to mine it just to break even, make a little $5,000 more? I don't think that's how it's going to work. But I will say this. It is interesting that everything kind of coming in line. It talks about how central banks, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, there was a, a piece that we covered a couple of weeks ago. I learned this from Guy from Coin Bureau. It's how central banks are going to be allowed to put on Bitcoin crypto digital assets on their balance sheets in 2025. Now, I think things are lining up here. If you don't, uh, haven't seen this before on my channel, which would be quite odd if you've been here for uh, longer than a week, the four-year cycles. Uh, it all starts, of course, with a halving in 2012. And this always happens. Then we get an all-time high after uh, about a year or so. Then there's a dip and a reset. 2016 happened again, halving. 2017, all-time high, a dip and a reset. And we just went through another one, right? We had a halving in 2020, double top 2021 at which is the all-time high. Then we had a monstrous 2022 year where everything kind of corroded. And then now we're in this, this reset point where again, we could come in in 2024 and 25 at an all-time high. Will this continue? Ah, it's anybody's guess, but it's uh, been going strong so far. However, there are some things to be aware of as to how this all happens because JP Morgan just told you it's all because of the halving and there is a narrative, let's be honest. We do talk about this narrative quite a bit, do we not? We do talk about scarcity, but I think in their people's minds are like, hey, wait, you know, gold isn't uh, totally finite. It may be scarce, but it's not finite like Bitcoin. Uh, so maybe when this halving does come along, maybe we're going to have issues. Maybe it could produce the, pr the price a little bit higher. However, having said that, there are three things to look at as we come into 2024 and 25. And I call this one Dixie, S&P, and M2. So we're going to take a look at three things. And it's going to talk about what may potentially pump the price of Bitcoin besides the narrative of the four-year cycles and Bitcoin having and the finite ability and the having of uh, Bitcoin miners. The first one is Dixie. Now, Dixie, if you're not familiar with it, it is the U.S. dollar compared to a basket of other currencies that we trade with. And it just depends on how strong or how weak the dollar actually is. This is called the Dixie. Now, very simply... When the Dixie goes up, Bitcoin goes down. When the Dixie goes down, Bitcoin goes up. And I've taken a look at this from 2009 all the way on. And you're going to see that. And of course, 
we take a look at the data that's presented for us. Maybe there's a little bit of cherry picking here and there, but you can see that uh, the Dixie, which was pretty high in 2013, around 83, uh, that means that Bitcoin goes down as, uh, of course, it's gone up since 2010. Then in 2014, the Dixie actually went down and Bitcoin went up. And there was a little bit of a price action, excuse me, of November 2013, almost in January 2014. And of course, again, when the Dixie goes down, Bitcoin goes up. Let's take a look at that again. Moving forward, 2014, 2018. We can see here in 2016, Dixie was a little bit high, was it not? That means Bitcoin goes down to around 610. Then of course the Dixie went down in 2017 and Bitcoin went up to almost $20,000. Then here we go again, Dixie goes up in May of 2018. And it isn't by much, I, I, I might add, but there's enough to make it move a little bit. And that is the Dixie. And we can take a look again on this continuum for the last cycle, down and up, down and up. The last big high was November 2021, where Dixie was falling a little bit, Bitcoin went up, but then when Dixie went up high enough, now in September 2022, Bitcoin went down. So it's just one thing to look at, but what about this? There's another thing that, that people have been talking about. Well, God, Rob, the, the macro events, the macro, NASDAQ and the S&P 500, S&P 500, Standard & Poor, this is 500 top companies. And they say that when these factors go, it's all about macro, don't you know? Well, it could, but then there's one more bigger factor. But if we take a look at S&P 500 over the years, going all the way back to 2012, 2011, we can see that uh, November 2013, when we were, I guess, would be like an all-time high at that point. Yes, Bitcoin was high. And then it goes a little bit on a trench, a little bit sideways. 2017, it goes up. And we take a look again, moving forward. Yes, I get it. That Bitcoin over in 2021 was also around the high of the S&P 500. So I'm not going to negate the fact that the macro does take effect. I think it does. I mean, obviously, right? If we're in a depression and we go through a halving, I don't know if Bitcoin's gonna hit all time highs. I'm not for sure. But again, if we take a look at this on, on a continuum, we can see that S&P since the inception of Bitcoin, 2008 was the white paper, 2009 was the Genesis block. We're gonna see that it just goes up and to the right until recently where things have fallen down. But I think there's an even bigger factor. And that bigger factor, if we take a look here, and we can see that, of course, Bitcoin goes right along lockstep with S&P 500. But the bigger factor itself is money supply. This is the M2 money supply. M1 is all the money in circulation plus bank deposits. M2 is M1 plus savings up to 100,000 plus money market mutual funds. And we can see that since 1960, all America has been doing is printing like crazy. And that's just the normal. So if we take a look at the money supply, and we overlay the S&P 500. This is from Ben's website, you know, the Cryptoverse, 10% off, you wanna check it out. A lot of great data, a lot of great alpha. We can see that if we overlay it, it's about the same thing. As the money supply grows, so does the S&P 500. If we do the same thing here, S&P 500. If we do Bitcoin, same thing. If we do gold, uh, there's a little bit of a, a non-correlation since 1980, but you can see that as the money supply goes up, so does, Bit so does gold itself. But to me, there is one factor that I can't get over, and that is this. We have been printing like crazy for quite some time, have we not? But only recently have we reduced the amount of the printing, quantitative tightening. And unfortunately, when we've gone down from not printing, the only time that's happened, it's been four other times. I hate to tell you this. But the, but the last four times that we have reduced the amount of money printing, because that seems like America loves to do, 1870s depression, panic of 1893, 1921 depression, and the Great Depression, 1932. So the other time that's happened is right now. Will this play out? I'm not for sure. But I will say this, that if we're taking a look at the macro effects, there was a story that just came out because everybody's worried about the Fed and what the Fed is going to do. But in the last uh, mi minutes, it looks like the Fed officials are less confident on the need for more rate hikes. This is what the minutes show. So quickly, the decision to increase the Fed's bankrupt benchmark rate by a quarter percentage point was unanimous. Meeting summary reflected disagreement over what the next move should be with a tilt toward a less aggressive policy. I got to tell you, if we pause in the next one in June, that would be pretty big. 
They voted to remove a key phrase from its post-meeting statement that had indicated additional policy firming may be appropriate. And some members judged that progress in reducing inflation was unacceptably low, which I believe actually they're right. I mean, inflation hasn't really come down like they've wanted it to, but that's not for me to decide. And would necessitate further hikes. However, the others, backed by several FOMC members, saw slowing economic growth which is what they want to do, in which further policy firming after this meeting may not be necessary. So what does that mean? Well, on the next meeting coming up in the 14th of June, here is what the market is anticipating. Right now, the current target rate is 500 to 525. They are thinking that they, the 500 to 525 is going to, they're going to pause. 33% say it's going to pause. And 66% say they are going to hike. I will tell you, as we get closer to the actual Fed meeting on 14th of June, you will see this very greatly. And every single time we get it, it seems like in the initial stages, the market is wrong. But then as we get closer, eh, they, pretty have, they, they have a better track record. So I would like to see that. And that is what I think could potentially move us into a Bitcoin pump into 2024, 2025, which is the macro, which hopefully it's improving. On top of that, there's other good news, which is there's a bigger use case for Bitcoin that uh, we've been talking about a little bit, but not as much as I thought it would actually explode to. Bitcoin suddenly becomes the second biggest NFT blockchain. <laughs> this was today. Over the last 30 days, Ethereum has processed $390 million worth of on-chain NFT transactions. During the same period, Bitcoin NFT transactions totaled $173 million, which is more than triple the amount on Solana which is a little less than 50 million. So again, if we're taking a look at use cases and everything that goes along with that, is it a store of value? Is it a method of, of transmission or transaction? Is it an NFT platform? Well, it looks to be all three things. This is a positive thing. Let me know what you think about that in the comments section and then finish up. Just a couple of things here. First of all, Ether balance on exchange is near, is near an all-time low. I was shocked by this. Uh, the number of Ether on exchanges hit a, a low not seen since July 2016 as staking saps up uh, available Ether. And I was like, well, uh, how much was it during the bull run? Great question. In contrast, during the bull market of 2021, the exchange balance was around 25 to 26%. And now we're all around 15%. So I know when people talk about, well, it's getting off exchanges and price should go up. It's going to be awesome. And the exchange doesn't have too much. Not necessarily. Ethereum price went up a whopping 1.3% in the last 24 hours, and it's at 1,800. It was a little bit less than $5,000 during the bull run. So just because things go off the exchanges and there's a little bit of scarcity, doesn't mean that it's gonna skyrocket the price. Sorry to let you know, but that's just the truth. And lastly, things to look out for, again, NFTs and the different platforms it's built on. Starbucks is airdropping more NFTs in June to expand Web3 Rewards program. Starbucks is building their NFT program on Polygon, just so you know. So first, airdrops only available for US residents. Second, each participant must be a Starbucks Rewards member enrolled in the Starbucks Odyssey, the company's waitlisted Web3 Rewards platform. I know this is actually even going on. It's amazing to me what people to do just to get a little bit of a discount, but it looks like they're doing it. They will then have to make sure to have completed two journeys. Example of a journey could be a going to a different Starbucks store or trying a new drink. I guess that'll be available in the app and then they just get uh, ticked off and then they, they get uh, their NFT and off they go. But again, I, I probably won't uh, go into this. I'm not a big Starbucks person, but it just goes to show you the power of progress. And we want to take a look at the platforms that are being built on. And Polygon is one of those platforms also. Crypto is already visible at Formula One events. And what's happening there? Well, as you can see, Tennis the Monica Formula One Grand Prix, which runs from May 26, 28, able to receive an NFT ticket issued on Polygon. Ticketing platform combines the robust security of Ethereum with the forge proof uniqueness of NFTs to enhance ticket authenticity and prevent counterfeiting. Because I'm always thinking to myself, like, why don't we just use tickets? It seems a lot easier. But apparently, this would be pretty good for counterfeiting. It also provides fans with lasting digital mementos. And also, it could be a pretty cool thing if they want to just kind of like loyalty programs, like, oh, you've gone to three of these races. Well, here's a VIP section. And of course, it's proven with NFTs and it's not counterfeitable. And off you go. So that, again, is what is going on in the market. 
And before we uh, sign off, just so you know, I'm super biased. So I talk about the things that I personally invest in, which would be Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Polygon. Now I invest in a host of other ones, but that was just the stories today. But that's it. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. I don't care who you subscribe to, but things are moving so fast. I think it would really behoove you to actually sign up and listen to somebody who you trust and you like to listen to. If that's me, so much the better. If not, just find somebody. But that's it for today. So thanks so much for stopping by. I do appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.